In 2001, the movie Jeepers Creepers was released. It was a horror film about a grotesque creature that wakes up every 23 years and eats human flesh for 23 days. Completely unrealistic, right? But do you know that Jeepers Creepers is based on real-life elements from a murder? The murder of Marilyn Depew, who was killed by her ex-husband, Dennis Depew, in April 1990? 49-year-old Marilyn Depew was born on January 24, 1941, in Detroit. She was one of two daughters born to Dallas and Betty McLeanahan. She graduated from Edsel Ford High School and attended Michigan State University. After receiving a degree in counseling from Wayne State University, she began her career teaching English at a high school in Livonia. In 1971, she met and married Dennis Depew, a Detroit native. They moved to Branch County in Coldwater, Michigan, where she was appointed as a substitute teacher at Coldwater High School and would later become the school's counselor. They went on to have three children together, Jennifer, Scott, and Julie. Marilyn was well respected in the community and beloved among her peers and students. However, behind closed doors, all was not well in the Depew household. Marilyn constantly told her friends and co-workers how unhappy and dissatisfied she was with her husband. They had contradictory personalities, where Marilyn was warm and welcoming, Dennis was sullen and withdrawn. He even isolated himself from the family and frequently accused Marilyn of, quote, turning the children against him. He was also controlling and didn't like how active Marilyn was within the community as well. Shortly before their 19th year together, Marilyn had enough and filed for divorce. After the divorce, the house was put in Marilyn's name, but Dennis was so controlling that he would keep the garage as his office. Even though Marilyn changed the locks of the house, one day she came home to find him seated in her sitting room. Dennis had visitation rights, but the children were reluctant to spend time with him. As the weeks passed, they started turning down going out with their father. Dennis blamed Marilyn, again accusing her of turning the children against him. Everything came to a head on Easter Sunday of 1990. Five months after the divorce, Dennis Depew arrived at Marilyn's home to pick up the kids. Dennis appeared to be calm when the younger daughter, 14-year-old Julie, said she didn't want to go with him. But when the oldest child also said he didn't want to go either, Dennis flew into a rage. He pulled at his son's arm, forcing him to come along. But 11-year-old Scott was adamant he was not going with Dennis. Marilyn tried to stop the standoff, but Dennis flew into a tirade, blaming Marilyn for brainwashing the kids. The more she tried to talk to him, the more infuriated he became. Right in front of the children, Dennis grabbed Marilyn and threw her down the stairs to the basement. He followed her down to the bottom of the stairs, where she lay crumpled in a heap and continued to beat her mercilessly. The children could only watch in paralyzed fear, screaming and begging him to stop. But Dennis did not. The eldest daughter, 16-year-old Jennifer, ran to a neighbor's house to call the police. A police officer arrived at the house expecting to break up a domestic situation, but all they saw were three children in tears. Their father was nowhere to be seen and neither was their mother. The officer questioned the children and was able to get a picture of what had happened. When Dennis was done hitting Marilyn at the bottom of the stairs, he picked her up and was carrying her to the van. The children tried to get their mother's attention, but she was unresponsive. Like she had been knocked unconscious, Dennis told the two kids that he was taking her to the hospital. The two youngest children could only look on as he put their injured and bleeding mother in the passenger seat of his van and drove off. That was the last thing they had seen. The officer checked with the local hospital, but there was no record of Marilyn or anyone that matched her injuries arriving there. The Michigan State Police realized that Marilyn had probably been abducted by Dennis. They began a widespread manhunt for a man driving a green 1984 Chevrolet van with Michigan plate number GZ3877. 
The officer patrolled public roads, but there was no sightings of the van or Dennis. Then, a lead came in. It was from a couple, and they had quite the story to tell. Earlier that afternoon, Ray and Marie Thornton were enjoying a Sunday drive along Snow Perry Road, a rustic highway back road outside Coldwater, Michigan. It was Easter Sunday, and the couple was playing a made-up game where they used the number plates to make up words and phrases. Suddenly, a green 1984 Chevrolet van appeared and overtook them at high speed. Marie exclaimed, Geez, he must be in a hurry. The letter on the plate was G-Z. She won that round. They continued their drive down the road till they saw the van again. This time, it was parked off the road between an abandoned school and a large tank. Marie spotted the driver going behind the abandoned building. In his hands, he held what looked like bloodied bedsheets. Marie was not sure what she had just seen. She turned to Ray and asked him if he had seen the man carrying the bloody sheets. He hadn't. They continued on their way and debated calling the police. Had she really seen what she thought she had seen? They were still thinking over what to do next when Ray glanced at the rearview mirror and saw that the van was back. It had caught up with them, only this time it stayed close and did not overtake them. For the next two miles, the man loomed over them, riding their bumper. What did he want to do with them? These were the thoughts that ran through their minds on that lonely stretch of road. As they got to an intersection and sped on ahead, they noticed that the van had pulled off to the side of the road. They breathed a sigh of relief, but they were now very suspicious about what the driver was up to and made the bold decision to go back and get his full plate number to report to the police. They turned the car around and headed back the way they had come. They soon reached the van and saw that the front passenger door was left wide open. The driver was nowhere to be seen, but they saw something that made their stomachs coil. The entire interior of the car was splattered with blood. As they passed the van, they saw the driver. He was crouched down behind the van, changing the license plates. He was so focused on his task that he didn't notice the people. He was just tailgating, or now surveilling him. The Thorntons had a sinking suspicion that they might have just witnessed a murder cleanup. They quickly decided to go back to the old schoolhouse and inspect the area. Perhaps they could see what had become of the bloody cheat the man had been holding, and what else was there. Or who? When they got to the old school, they traced the route they had seen the man walking to the back of the building. There, in a barely concealed animal hole, they found a bedsheet. A huge portion of it was red with blood. The couple hurried back to their cars to find somewhere they could call the police. Based on the description of the van, authorities were certain that this was Dennis DePew getting rid of his ex-wife's body. Michigan State Police and the Sheriff's Office got to the area the couple had last seen the van, but he was long gone. The forensic team sealed off the abandoned schoolhouse and began to search for Marilyn. They found a pool of blood and some tire tracks. Later on, the tracks would be linked to Dennis's van. The pool of blood and the blood found on the sheets were attached to Marilyn, but there was no Marilyn. The authorities were concerned that Dennis had killed her and was getting rid of the evidence before he went on the run. The next day, construction workers with Branch County spotted a body in the Bethel Township beside a church, a wooded area near Bronson, five miles away from the schoolhouse. It was identified as the body of 48-year-old Marilyn Depew. She had died from a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. The three Depew children lived in fear that their father would come back and finish them off for not going with him that Easter Sunday. They were taken into police protection. With no leads as to his whereabouts, authorities looked into Dennis Depew's life for clues about where he might have gone. Nothing in his life said murderer. He was born in St. Joseph, Michigan, and he grew up in Burr Oak, Michigan. 
He attended Baroque High School and received a bachelor's degree in business education from Michigan State University. Then began his career as a property tax specialist in the Department of Treasury for the state of Michigan. He also taught business education in Portland, Orlando, and in Los Angeles, California. Dennis enjoyed going to sports events as an alumni of Michigan State University. He was even a regular churchgoer, but the authorities would also find out that Dennis had emptied his bank account. The change in plate numbers also showed he was prepared to be a fugitive. Two weeks later, the letters started coming. The first was to Coldwater High School, the school Marilyn worked for. In the letter, Dennis blamed them for her death. In the ensuing days, co-workers, friends and relatives, and news outlets received letters from Dennis. They were tirades from Dennis trying to justify killing Marilyn. He blamed friends and family for causing her death. Quote, Marilyn had every right to a divorce. It read, but she made a fatal mistake in lying and deceiving to force Dennis out of the house and estranging the children from Dennis. The letter said that if only Marilyn had watched the movie War of the Roses, she would have understood that a husband can lie in his home even after a divorce and, quote, everything would have been solved already. Another letter read, quote, Marilyn had many, many opportunities to treat me fairly during this divorce, and she chose to string it out, trick me, lie to me, and when you lose your wife, your children, and home, there's not much left. I was too old to start over. In yet another letter, he quoted Bible scriptures, quote, an eye for an eye, a life for a life. The letters were about 11 pages each. Some were handwritten and others were typed. In total, Dennis would send out 17. The postmarks of these letters range from Iowa to Oklahoma. The FBI now knew why they couldn't pinpoint his location. Dennis was constantly on the move, going from state to state across the South. His last letter came three months after his disappearance. The authorities had no more leads to find him. A felony warrant was issued against Dennis. A year later, at 8 p.m. on Wednesday, the 20th of March, 1991, across many homes in the United States, viewers' eyes were glued on NBC's widely acclaimed TV show, Unsolved Mysteries. Barbara Harris of Garland, Texas, was not any different. It was a weekly American mystery documentary that reenacted cold cases missing people, wanted suspects, and paranormal phenomena. Viewers were invited to call in with any sightings they had of the suspects. That night's episode was on a wanted man who a year before on Easter had brutally beaten his ex-wife in front of their children and abducted and killed her in cold blood in Michigan. A picture of the wanted man's face flashed on the screen and she realized much to her horror, that she knew this man, and he was living with her best friend, Linda Blizzard. He had told them his name was Hank Queen. Linda had met Hank at a Halloween party at a popular night spot in Dallas. Dennis told her he was a graduate of Michigan State University and worked for a publishing company doing illustrations. He was also an avid sports fan. The two had hit it off and soon started dating. Pretty soon, Hank moved in with her in Garland, Texas. But Barbara was very suspicious of her friend's new boyfriend. He always carried cash, never left the house during the day, and never drove his van. Ever. Now she knew why. Immediately, she made the connection. She called Linda to tell her that a wanted killer was in her house, but it was too late. Dennis, aka Hank Queen, was long gone. Around 8 p.m., Linda returned from work to see Hank's van sitting on the driveway. This was a first. Hank rarely ever took his car out of the garage. Once inside, he told her that he needed to leave for a week. His mother, he said, was very ill 
and he needed to go home to take care of her that very night. As he rifled through the house gathering his things, the week's episode of Unsolved Mysteries played on the TV, but Hank didn't allow her to watch it. He kept her occupied in the kitchen, asking that she prepare sandwiches that he would need for the long drive home. Yet, even in his hurry, she noticed that he paid close attention to the TV. By the time she was done making his snacks, the show was over. Hank loaded his things into his van, he told her that he would call her in a week, and drove off into the night. In retrospect, he hoped to get a head start before any of her friends saw the episode. But it was too late. That night, over 50 viewers called the toll-free line to report their sighting of Dennis Depew. The phone call from Barbara Harris stood out. She had told them that a man called Hank Queen, who looked exactly like Dennis Depew, and attended Michigan State University, had been living with her friend in Texas, but had just taken off. She even had his license plate number and rattled it off to the police. Immediately, the FBI contacted the Fort Worth Police Department in Dallas, alerting authorities that the wanted man was in the Garland area of Texas. Four hours later, long before the break of dawn, after a night of furious driving, Dennis Depew had made it into Louisiana. He thought he was home free, till Louisiana police spotted his green van speeding recklessly and conducted a cursory stop. Dennis refused and the police officer gave chase. After running the plate numbers and realizing that the plate numbers had been stolen, the officer called for backup. They set up a roadblock, but Dennis went right through without stopping. The high-speed chase continued, and more Louisiana State Troopers joined to stop it before anyone got hurt. But they had no idea that the person they were chasing was a wanted fugitive and a murderer. At 3.15 a.m., Louisiana officials alerted Mississippi police that they were headed to the Mississippi border and were in pursuit of a van with a stolen Texas plate number. Warren County deputies and Vicksburg police sprang into action and set up a roadblock over the Mississippi River at the end of the interstate bridge with directives to only shoot out the tires. Again, Dennis drove right through the speed block, but not before one of the tires was shot out. He rammed two police cars and fired two shots through the windscreen of his van. He fired another couple out of the van side window at a police officer. Once the sheriff learned he was shooting, he gave orders for Depew to be taken out. Another of his tires was shot out, but Dennis was not stopping. The van turned off from the interstate highway and headed into the residential area of Vicksburg. Deputies were now determined to end the chase before anybody else got hurt. A machine gun was fired into the rear of the van as other officers exchanged gunfire with the driver, but the myriad of clothes and boxes in the vehicle kept the bullets from hitting their mark. Dennis managed to drive on the rims for half a mile before the car eventually gave up and stopped. He continued to shoot at officers, then there was one more shot and then silence. Cautiously, authorities approached the vehicle. At 4 a.m., the body of Dennis Depew was found slumped behind the wheel of his van. A .357 Magnum pistol in his left hand, his thumb on the trigger, and blood trickling down his neck. He had died from a self-inflicted single bullet wound that entered through his mouth and exited through the top of his head. In his pocket, they would find $16,000. The passenger seat of the van had brown stains that would turn out to be the residue of Marilyn Depew's blood from a year before. Dennis was buried at Eagle Cemetery in LaGrange County, Indiana, far away from his wife's final resting place in Oakland County, Michigan. After their father committed suicide, the three children were removed from police protection and lived with their grandparents for a while. Their privacy has been kept ever since. The youngest, Scott, is on probation till July 2023, after an incident where he attacked a garbage collector back in 2020. They are well into their 60s now.